From the Oklahoma Newsroom, it's another Thunder Thursday, talking all things Thunder here from the Oklahoma studios. I'm Jenny Carlson, joined by part of our Thunder coverage team, columnist Barry Trammell and Thunder beat writer Eric Horn, Thunder beat writer Brett Dawson, somewhere in transit on the eastern seaboard. We'll give him a pass today. But uh, guys, he saw quite a performance by one Alex Abrinish last night in uh, New Orleans. Uh, he's actually, Brett is actually writing about Abrinish some for the Friday Oklahoma and News OK, but um, Eric, what happened last night with Alex Sabrinas? Where did this come from? You know, it was it was like a comprehensive bench performance last night. I think it was a couple of different things. Uh, first and foremost, the, the New Orleans Pelicans aren't very good. <laughs> yeah. um, second of all, you know, I think the Thunder did a good job uh, just going back and looking at, at, at some of the plays of, of freeing up Abrinas. I mean, there, there were plays where he was used as the screener, where the Thunder, uh, Jocker Laverne and Ennis Kanter set really good screens for him. And, and once he saw those first couple go down, uh, it was really, it seemed like it was just a waterfall from there in terms of his three-point shooting. He yeah. even had a couple of three-pointers that rimmed out, so he could have had an even bigger night. And, and that arguably, to me, wasn't even his, his most impressive shot. I mean, he had 18 points. Uh, only three of them came away from the three-point line, but he had a play where he drove into the lane and he scored on an and one. And, and to me, it really showed kind of a, a the diversity of his game at times that we can get from this guy. And it, it's kind of a little bit of what we, we thought we were going to get from him when he came over from Spain. Yeah. Well, is, I guess now it begs the question, Barry. Okay, we've seen it once. We've seen that diversity of his game and just how, you know, potentially good he could be. Can he do it again? Can he replicate it again for the Thunder? Well, I don't know. I, I saw some good signs. He seemed to be uh, gaining in confidence the deeper the game went. He was looking for the ball, looking to launch quickly. Even more important, Russell Westbrook was looking for him mm -hmm. when they played together. Westbrook was uh, trying to set up a Breenish. So uh, the truth of the matter is Anthony Morrow has been a little bit of a disappointment. His shooting has not been up to his usual high standards. Therefore, you've seen more Breenish. Uh, in the last week or two. So there are opportunities there. And if he if he wants to uh, continue to play like this, he's going to get to play. And, and you know, it, to me, it was fascinating that the Thunder was, I mean, this wasn't stuff that he was just getting just off of loose balls. They were running plays for this guy. I mean, mm -hmm. that they, they, these guys were specifically setting screens to get Alex Abrinas open from three. Uh, they were, like I said, they were including him as the screener, and then Russell Westbrook would drive and, and use another screen as a decoy and then kick out to Abrinas. I mean, these were plays that were set up to, to give this guy success. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder if Billy Donovan, you know, went into this saying, this is a team and this is a situation where we can really get this guy going. And, and like Billy Donovan says time and time again, he wants to keep these guys involved throughout the season, be it a Alex Sabrinas, a Kyle Singler, whoever. He wants to keep everybody involved and ready to play. Yeah, and you know, I, I think it, you see this from Alex Sabrinas with that second group, and we all knew he was going to have some growing pains. I mean, coming to mm. the United States from Spain, being a, a rookie, a younger guy, slighter build, we knew he was going to have some growing pains. But now you sort of start to wonder, okay, if this can be replicated, where does he fit? Because Victor Oladipo is coming back at some point. You're going to see the, the second unit regain um, some firepower when that happens. How does he fit in? I mean, what's sort of the – and eventually, we think, uh, they're going to get a point guard back too. I mean, how does this impact potentially that second group, Barry? Well, I mean, I think uh, Alex Abrinish and, and Anthony Morrow are in the battle for playing time mm -hmm. because they do the exact same things. They're both – Outside shooters who have shown that they can do score in other ways. Uh, both are a suspect on defense, and you, you've got to measure their minutes depending on who's playing and how long you can go with them. So, uh, you know, if Abrinish keeps playing like this, then I think it means uh, Anthony Morrow plays less. Yeah. Is it a hot hand situation, Eric? I mean, do they, do they roll with a guy until he, he cools off? Or, is like Barry says, when you've got a young guy who probably has a longer-term future with your franchise, do you tend to sort of let him play it out maybe a little longer? You know, I think it's going to be one of those night-to-night -night things or maybe week-to-week -week game, chunk of games to chunk of games thing, you know. Mm -hmm. We've seen this happen time and time again, and people might not want to hear this, you know, get disappointed with Billy Donovan and his, and his consistent rotations or inconsistent rotations. Uh, bringing in a guy like a Kyle Singer, bringing in Alex Abrinas, uh, after he's basically hasn't played a ton of minutes in, in the past few games, you know, playing Joffrey Laverne extended minutes last night when he might have had 12 minutes over the last three games. Billy Donovan is going to continue to shuffle guys in and out and, and see what the best matchups are night to night. It doesn't hurt to get Alex Sabrina some, some quality minutes and, 
and see what he can go out and produce for you. And, and like you said, uh, this is a guy that's going to be on contract for the next few years. Anthony Morrow is enter entering the final year of his deal. So it's, it's going to be important for them to get Alex Sabrina some confidence going into you know, his, the continuation of his Thunder career. All right, we've talked for about five or six minutes here on Thunder Thursday, and we haven't talked about Russell Westbrook, so it's time. That's long enough. Uh, <laughs> Russell Westbrook obviously uh, continuing to put up amazing numbers, but probably the, the biggest news, I guess, with him was earlier this week, that last uh, sequence of, uh, of the game there at home against Atlanta. Two-minute report comes out. Uh, NBA saying he was not only fouled once, he was fouled twice in the final 10 seconds of that game. Two-minute reports. I mean, Barry, we these are fascinating because they really do sort of open the door to what is happening uh, with the officiating, keeping them, uh, I guess, an honest sort of look at what happens. But I mean, is this is this good for anybody? I mean, I don't know. I mean, is it is it validation? Does it hurt the league? What do you make of the two-minute report? I like it. I think it's transparency, and uh, coaches sometimes get mi gets mixed up on the information and the, uh, what it can do. It doesn't change anything. It's not going to change anything. It's not to repair a, a wrong situation. That's not what it's about. It's about transparency and, and to let the fans particularly know that the league does monitor officiating. It does uh, monitor who's making good calls, who's making bad calls. What are the calls being made? Uh, sometimes we think that these guys are just thrown out there and with, with no supervision. I got a call this week from a fan wanting to know, are there ramifications for uh, officials who make such mistakes? And the answer is yes. Eventually, you could lose your job. Uh, you could have uh, postseason uh, curtailed. So yeah, the, the league is paying attention to officiating, and we know that because they tell us in public ways, this two-minute report, about mistakes. What about it, Eric? Is this helping anybody to have these out? Well, you know, I, I, I guess it would help, you know, the credibility of, of, of Billy Donovan, you know, sticking up for his players after the fact. Uh, I think it probably gives the referees more grief than they than they'd ever want to handle. I mean, we first got a taste of this in the in the playoffs last year. It seemed like every day we were looking at the two minute reports because the Thunder were playing these crazy games, and uh, particularly game two against the Spurs, where there was just that crazy sequence where there was probably about five or six missed calls just in a 13 second span. Mm -hmm. So I think in certain instances, it, it really does help. To, to kind of clarify those late game situations and, and it might help referees to go back and look at situations like for instance uh, in the situation with Deion Waiters and in that game two against the Spurs I think that was a situation where the referees had admitted that they had never seen some of that stuff happen before that in that kind of sequence so, and remind people that was the push that, yeah that was yeah. that was that was, the, that was the, 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 the Manu Ginobili real tight on Deion Waiters on the sideline and Deion Waiters came with the elbow like this and that was a situation where I think referees had admitted like you know this is rare that we, we've never seen this before or, or, or it might not have been referees it was so, someone in that whole that whole realm of the play that admitted that they had never seen that before. But it was a very tough call. And I think that it could be a teaching tool, mm -hmm. the last two-minute second, two minute report, to where maybe we can get a better understanding of how to handle <laughs> these situations going forward. Right. Um, and I think, but I think it does need to be tweaked a little bit. For instance, I think in the Rockets game a few weeks ago, there was a, there was a call at the end, but there wasn't a last two-minute report because the game was, wasn't within five points when it hit that two-minute mark. Mm. It was within six points. Oh. <laughs> so it's kind of like, uh, where, do we, where do we draw the line? I mean, the line that's it been drawn. It sounds like five so, and a half points is the line. Yeah. <laughs> the, the line has been drawn at a point where it should kind of be a game-to-game -game basis where, you know, if we're within a certain amount of points, it shouldn't matter. It should be, is this a call that could turn the game within the context within of the game, reason. Like, within yeah. reason. Yeah, well, and I think you guys bring up an interesting point, both of you sort of in different ways, but sort of the what, what do they do with this? You know, I think the idea of transparency, Barry, I mean, in the media, we generally are fans of transparency, but then sort of the what next? Like if somebody messes up, you know, in a close game, in a tight situation that could determine a game, what does that do? I mean, it would be interesting if the NBA would open that up even a little bit more to say, if this happens, then, you know, we've got this point system or you lose a, a chance to be in the playoffs. I don't know. It seems like that might help to explain how they're using some of this because I think the assumption is sort of what you said, Eric, that, you know, in situations they can cue up tape when they're doing 
you know, training sessions mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. But is there more? Are there ramifications? And that's, I mean, we assume, but we, do we really know? Well, yeah, we do. I mean, they pick refs uh, for the playoffs. Uh, they change refs. Guys are ushered out. We, they don't make a big scene of it. We don't, I mean, we could figure out who got fired last off in NBA <laughs> offseason. If we true. wanted to, just go make a look and see who's still calling. We don't really care until our team is affected by a bad call. Sure. That's really when we care about officiating. You go to a big game and it's well officiated, and that's the last thing you're going to talk about. Mm -hmm. But if it's poorly officiated, it's the first thing you're going to talk about. That's just the uh, lay of the land for officials. Yeah, and Eric, you and I and uh, our, your buddy Brett Dawson have been doing sort of an unofficial. I think eventually this will see the light of day because it's interesting. But with the Thunder not being that elite level team, we've kind of been doing a, a, a non-scientific look at the officials who call the Thunder games. And it's not the elite level officials like the Thunder were an elite level team for a lot of years. You might see one name that you go, I see that guy or that gal all the time. The others, not so, not so much. It seems like there may be, as uh, you sort of get down the pecking order of quality of teams and quality of games, they're working in guys and gals that may be beginning or don't get as many games to get them that game experience as officials. I think that's something we will look at eventually as the season goes on. Yeah, it's, you know, the, the Thunder hasn't had an opportunity to have many of the Danny Crawfords of the world so far this season. I think it might have been two games they've had uh, Danny Crawford, one of the more respected uh, officials in the NBA. And it's kind of been a mixed match of, you know, names that we're not used to seeing uh, in, in, in the high profile games that the Thunder have played in the past. We haven't done the deep dive on anything. Right now, it's just kind of our crazy conspiracy <laughs> theory in house. But uh, it, it would be interesting to, to, to sit down and, and, and look at how the, the, the league is determining who the Thunder gets on a night to night basis. And I think it's important to know that these all these officials have been, you know, gone through a high level of scrutiny when it comes to officiating games. It's more about experience, I think, mm -hmm. at this point. There's definitely, I mean, it, it's, it's bound to happen. It happens in the NFL. It happens in NHL. It happens in Major League Baseball. Different levels of experience. And obviously, the more you've seen, the more easy it is to recognize things. As you were mentioning with that, you know, the elbow, that m maybe nobody's seen that, but there's a lot yeah. of stuff that as you're in the game longer, you see more often and are able to call more easily. And, and it hasn't become a point of contention just yet, but we've seen numerous times this season Russell Westbrook lobbying for calls, mm -hmm. uh, Billy Donovan stepping in and, and lobbying for calls too. He, he's probably, he probably has more technicals already than he's had, than he had all of last season, or up to, certainly up to this point last season. So they're being vocal about the way that Russell Westbrook is being treated and, and, and not that he's not getting to a line at a higher rate. He's over 10 a game and he's among the leaders in the league in free throw attempts. But they want to continue to have that conversation with referees and officials about, you know, how they're refereeing the game against Russell Westbrook. All right. Lots of good Russell Westbrook talk. Thanks, guys. That made me feel better after five minutes of no Russell Westbrook. You're watching Thunder Thursday, by the way. We're talking all things Thunder here. And as I mentioned before, guys, obviously Victor Oladipo – out of the lineup right now, uh, wrist injury that, frankly, when you look at it, you, you know, you could see that wrist injury being a, a season ender, but uh, they've now played, uh, what, five games without him, six games without him? We're starting to get a little sense of how this team looks without Victor Oladipo. I mean, you'd rather have him, Barry, but how have they fared without him in the lineup? They've done better than I actually thought they might. Um, the, the offense has been pretty good. They've held the offense up. I think they've actually missed Oladipo more on defense than they have offense. They've having to use Abrinish and, and Morrow more often. Oladipo is a very good perimeter defender, uh, can switch off, um, has had a good track record in Orlando uh, guarding. So I think they miss him on the defense. You look at games like Atlanta, they lost that game because of their defense. Uh, last night, uh, the defense played well down the stretch, but for a good chunk of the game in New Orleans, did not play well. So uh, they really need Oladipo back as much for defensive as anything. You know, we've been talking about a, a two-way uh, two-guard for four, five, six years. Mm -hmm. Thunder has one. Be nice if he could play. Yeah, what what has been your impression of, of I mean, eventually, initially when he left, defense, it, we saw it right away. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, you know, the defense is really having a, a struggle here. Have you seen it shore up a little bit, Eric? I mean, obviously they want him back. They don't want to go forever without him. But have you seen some change, at least defensively, to, to, to sort of fill that gap? I think there's been more comfort as, as the time has gone on since he's been out. But you got to keep in mind also the first two teams they played – 
full games against when, when he was out were against two of the top ten offenses in the league in Portland and Utah. I mean, two uh, really efficient offenses. And in the last three games, uh, they've gone two and one. And, I mean, they sh they probably should have won the Atlanta game if not for the defense, as Barry said. And it, I think they gave up a 14-4 to run to end the game, or uh, 14-2, somewhere along those lines. But, you know, Phoenix and, and, and New Orleans aren't very good offenses, aren't very good teams in general. So you would, have, you would want the Thunder to have better games against those teams. But, but yeah, he certainly missed. And, and not to... So nothing's misconstrued. I think Jenny made a reference to it earlier. He is not out for the season. You didn't say he was out no, for no, the no, season. No, 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 no. You said I said the way that injury looked. Yeah, it looked. He could have yeah, been out it, for the season. Yeah, it could have been a dangerous thing. But I don't want anybody to hear anything on <laughs> Thunder Thursday and be like, "Oh, Victor Oladipo's out." Uh, it's indefinite, and and you know it could be a prolonged injury. But I think the Thunder is taking their time with this and not rushing him back. <laughs> it's December. They're. They're going into their 30th game of the season on Friday. There's no reason to rush Victor Oladipo back uh, when they're going to need him for this entire season. They want him to get 100% healthy. Do you have a sense, Eric, from what you're hearing? Is it a couple more weeks? Is it a month? Do you have any sense of a timetable for Victor Oladipo? I don't think they've put a particular length of time on how long he's going to be out. I just think that you know, it's going to be a day-by-day -day prog progression. You should basically call him day-to-day. -day. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could probably say the same thing for Cameron Payne, who I'm, I'm sure we'll get to in a little bit. But... Uh, you know, this is a guy who earlier this week wasn't even using his right hand. So you just got to keep that in mind that if he's doing solely things with just his left hand, he's doing no activity with his right, that's a shooting hand, uh, that's, that's the flick of the wrist, uh, and that's, that's really important, and the Thunder's not going to push that. All right, you mentioned Cameron Payne. Let's talk about Cameron Payne because here's a guy. He's that, dancing. <laughs> he's, he's a guy that we might have a timetable on, or do we? I mean, ESPN reporting that, uh, there's a December 29th return potentially against Memphis for Cameron Payne. Um, I mean, Bear, are you buying that? Do you feel like uh, from, you know, as Eric said, we've seen a little more dance activity out of Cameron Payne. Is it, is it about time? Well, I mean, you would think so, but I, I got to believe he's, he needs to start practicing before he plays. Mm -hmm. I mean, he really hasn't gone through a full speed practice. So I think we're still a little bit out on, on Cameron Payne. I also think we're a little bit, uh, heavy on the expectations of what he's going to do when he gets back. When you look at him, he hasn't ended up playing that much. Uh, didn't get much this, uh, this preseason, certainly hasn't played. Down the stretch last season in the playoff, did not end up in the rotation. This is a guy who is a second year guy, hasn't played all that much NBA basketball. Uh, I, th I think even when he's back, it's going to take a while for him to get into the swing of the rotation. His impact could at some point be significant, Eric, but obviously the rust, I mean, if he's a if he's a six or eight year veteran, maybe he can knock it off a little faster, but he's got some developmental stuff to come through. I guess the question in part becomes uh, sort of what you said about Victor Oladipo, though, should he come back this quick? I mean, if there's any question, don't you just wait? I mean, is there is there sort of a sense of is this too early amongst the Thunder at this point? You know, you, you'd like to ideally have him back considering that the Thunder's really getting into a, a part of the schedule in, in December, I mean, not December, in January, where they're going to be going on the road facing some tougher teams. But again, like Barry said, he, even when this guy gets back, what's his level of conditioning going to be? Uh, what's his rhythm going to be like? Uh, how is he going to mesh? With the, with the second unit when he comes back, is he going to play any defense? Because he didn't play any defense beforehand when he was here, as gifted as he is offensively. I mean, he, he put in the effort defensively, but he was still you know on that rookie level in terms of his defensive schemes and awareness. So what he's going to bring or what he can bring down the line will definitely be beneficial to the Thunder as they're fighting for a playoff spot. I just don't know if it's going to be able to help them uh, in a week from now because he hasn't practiced yet or even in the first week of January if he does come back uh, when they get back on the road so to get him back in the beginning of January mid January time I think would be ideal for the Thunder but uh, again it's going to be time for him to get back to where they they want him to be or where he wants to be all right two more topics before we wrap up guys we're talking about players the Thunder wishes they had but don't have right now so that brings me to all Anthony this Davis trade talk I was actually going to say DeMarcus Cousins, <laughs> but if you just want to go straight to Anthony Davis, well, oh, jump on in there. But there's been some talk after all this uh, brouhaha in uh, Sacramento. Could DeMarcus Cousins potentially be a target for the Thunder? Barry, is it kooky talk or potentially a possibility? I think it's kooky talk. Um, first off, Thunder has a center. 
They got a good backup center. In fact, they might they have one of the better center situations in the league. It's not a weakness by any point. It's a team strength. Now, Cousins is a superstar, no doubt about it. He, uh, what do you have? 55? 55. 55, uh, 55 uh, uh, the other night. So um, he's a ball playing fool. There's no <laughs> doubt about it. But Thunder strong at center. They got Adams, they got Canner, and they don't have a history of handing $20 million a year to a knucklehead. And <laughs> that's what Cousins is. I mean, he's, he is a, uh, he's a troubled young soul. And he does not have a history of getting along with the environment that he's in. And I, that, the Thunder has taken a risk or two on a small minute players. They will bring in a guy with a sketchy past only if he's completely, if they're completely sold that he can adapt to the, uh, to the Thunder culture and they don't have a lot invested in him and they don't expect a lot out of him. <laughs> they, with Boogie Cousins, you're going to have to invest a lot. You're going to expect a lot. Sure. It seems like a disastrous plan to me. Well, and Eric, we were talking about this earlier today just in the office, and it seems like um, obviously Sacramento is a poison well. I mean, it's obviously there's been problems, issues. Uh, it seems like there's always a mess going on in Sacramento. But DeMarcus Cousins played. I can't call him Boogie, by the way. I'm having trouble that's with that. Fine. I, that that's I, fine. His, I don't birth feel... his birth name is perfectly fine. I, 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 I think I, his mother would be okay with that. He would, too. <laughs> I appreciate that. But, you know, he played He played on the Olympic team. He's played internationally. Granted, you're not going to have that many superstars on any one team in the NBA. But he's been around these guys. They have a sense of what he can do, who he is, when he's maybe not in Sacramento. Is, is there a chance that he can could be better if in a different situation, Eric. Yeah, there's always a chance. Uh, I think he's a guy, well, I don't know if he's a guy. I don't know that for sure. I don't know if he's a guy that could go somewhere else and, and be a, a model citizen that you'd want. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's always, an, there's always a chance. And I think that the Thunder has a good culture. And I think that it's intriguing to think about a guy like that with that much talent coming over and the Thunder being able to, to integrate him into their culture and into Oklahoma City. I mean, the thing is, what you're going to have to give up to get him, right? Um, Which we it, haven't even talked about yet. Right. right. It, it, if if you're give, if you're getting an All Star caliber player, uh, a, a player who's a who's a All NBA caliber guy, you're going to have to give up All NBA potential talent, draft picks. Uh, they might ask for Russell Westbrook, uh, <laughs> and, and you're not going to give him up because it's Russell Westbrook. You're going to want to pair him with Russell Westbrook. So you know that's when you bring in a third team. That's when. You, you know, you try to kind of get another team to come in or you give up future draft picks. But again, it, it, it's all really difficult to say that things like that can happen, a guy like DeMarcus Cousins or a Paul George, uh, because it, it's tough to imagine giving up a Steven Adams and a Victor Oladipo, and then basically you're starting from scratch midway through the season. Yeah. And, and, and you don't know what you're going to get from DeMarcus Cousins headwise. You, you, you'd assume you'll get great play from him, but – do you risk the chemistry while giving up the players that you know can deliver for you in this setting? Yeah, and lastly, that sort of brings up the question, with all of those factors in play, I mean, you've mentioned Anthony Davis, we've mentioned DeMarcus Cousins, uh, you know, Paul George, there's Rudy Gay, we've talked about him a couple of times on Thunder Thursday. Uh, maybe none of those guys make sense, but is there someone out there that you guys have, have thought about that seems like a possibility? Because I don't think there's any doubt in anyone's mind that Sam Presti is going to try to do something to make life easier on Russell Westbrook, to, to, to move the needle, to push things forward, to continue to get better. Is there an option out there that you guys think could be feasible? Otto Porter comes to my mind. Uh, the Washington uh, swing man uh, playing much better uh, under Scotty Brooks. Uh, good scorer, not a great scorer, good scorer, good defender. I think he could, uh, I think he could be had perhaps straight up for Ennis Cantor and you know, whatever makes the, the trade work out. He strikes me as a poor man's Al Horford. Well, he's more of a, he's more of a perimeter guy. He's more of a, I mean, he's, he's a poor man Paul George, I would say. Okay. So uh, he fits the need. You know, they, the Thunder's strong inside, but they're a little thin on the perimeter. So... I think Porter could uh, could perhaps really an, help. Perhaps an attitude. He's one of those sort of, you know. He does seem like a very solid citizen. Yeah. No, no, not a, no doubt about it. Uh, almost, 
not a wallflower, but he's a guy that you can watch a game and really not notice him right. because he doesn't try to be, all he does is play. He doesn't right. really try to be flamboyant. So Washington's really going nowhere. I don't know what the Thunder could do to make a trade like that, but to me that would be a, a very interesting addition. Hey, if the Thunder wanted to add another player from the 2013 draft class, <laughs> Otto Porter would be the guy, huh? They're just going to get them all. Yeah, just, just, just stockpile all the, t uh, the 2013 guys. Uh, you know, see if they can get Giannis Antetokounmpo while they're at it, too. Uh, <laughs> you just want to say his name on a regular basis. <laughs> Costas Papa Nicolau. How do you, how, how you like that? No, that guy's not coming. Um, you know, I, I actually like Kelly Uber, the guy that's on, uh, that's on Washington, too, who's coming off the bench. Uh, from Kansas, he's got a, he's young and he's got the the nice lefty stroke. He can he can hit a three and he's got that six seven six six body. But um, you know anybody on Denver? Uh, I feel like Denver is just their entire team's up for grabs. They they don't they really want a superstar, a, a bona fide guy uh, that can that can really get people excited. Uh, it seems like the, the most excited Denver's crowd gets is, is when um, Russell Westbrook is in there and doing all kinds <laughs> of crazy plays. And that's not a knock on Denver's crowd. It, 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 great fan base. And, but it, it seems like they're really looking for a star. They haven't had that guy since Carmelo Anthony's there. And they've got a lot of pieces like Wilson Chandler, Danilo Gallinari, uh, Gary Harris, uh, Jamal Murray, the guy they drafted this year. A lot of guys, but not true superstar guys. So it would be interesting to see uh, – not just the Thunder, but it, what other teams are going to be looking at those guys on, on, on the Nuggets going forward? Oh, Will Barton, a guy like that. Uh, they, they just got plenty of players that can really contribute <laughs> to, to other a team. teams. Yeah, that can, <laughs> <laughs> a, bunch, a bunch of guys that can really contribute to other teams, but together don't really put you over the top in, in, a, in a really tough Western Conference. They're a Napa Auto Parts store, and they need, they need somebody well, to, to drive the car that's in that needs the pieces, and then yeah. out they go. Russell Westbrook can drive the car, and, you know, <laughs> they can like be the rich. Yeah. By yeah. the way, trade deadline isn't until February. We're talking trades. February 23rd. December. We have got two months to still talk trades. We're just getting started. Be sure to stay with the best coverage team anywhere at newsok.com and every day in the Oklahoman.